I'm Scott Al Miller, and this is my daily life living as a full-time expat living abroad around the world. Right now, I'm living in Nicaragua, and I've been here for quite some time, and today I want to take a little bit of time to talk about my family's story of how we became expats, what made us made that decision, and what led us to be who we are. Uh, a lot of people ask this or wonder, I'm sure, and on the live stream just last week, uh, someone asked about our background story and how we came to be in Nicaragua, what led us to that decision, what made us start thinking about Nicaragua. And so I thought I would share some of what made us find this place and others on today's show. So let's get to that right after that bump. Since I was young, the idea of living abroad is something that has always appealed to me. But when I was young, I didn't really think that I would, or perhaps I didn't know that I could. Even moving to Canada, which I grew up very much on the border, is relatively difficult. You can't just casually move to Canada as an American. You can visit very easily. But actually relocating and living there and getting a job is rather challenging. And so it never really occurred. And I never knew anyone who had ever even considered doing such a thing. So that made moving abroad very uh, uh, hard to grasp, and not something that would just cross your consciousness. As an American growing up in the Northeast, especially in very, very isolated Western New York, I had practically zero encounters through my entire childhood of anyone who had ever been to another country other than Canada, let alone moved to one. Uh, I had one very isolated experience with one of my best friends. His parents lived in Guatemala briefly in the early 1970s, but they were there uh, as part of a known temporary thing. They were there for some time, but it was known to be a temporary thing where they were helping with some projects. So that was like, of course, you could go as part of like, you know, Peace Corps or something like that to other countries. And of course, you could visit like and I had a lot of family, like my grandparents would go on vacation sometimes to other countries. Uh, my grandmother brought me, you know, gifts as a small child from Switzerland when she went there. Uh, uh, as an example. So I was very familiar with international travel, knew that we could do that, always wanted to, thought that was super interesting and probably something important to do. So that was always in my mindset. But literally until I was uh, probably a junior in high school, this is the first time I ever met someone who had moved to the United States from another country. Think about that. I grew up in a part of the United States in an era where the concept of an immigrant was so foreign. Of course, we knew about them from like Ellis Island, but we thought of immigrants, even in my childhood, as multi-generational past of like Italians and Irish coming through New York City when there were major issues in Europe and there was always some reason why the United States was specifically taking those people and it had been a hundred years ago. It was things that happened in black and white when famines were the kind of things that people were panicking about in Europe, right? So it was a completely different aspect to meet someone who had moved to the United States from another country, in this case, the Philippines, was a bit surprising. It was a context that we didn't have. It was like, what brought you here? Why? Why? And, and in such a rural location, if you're coming to the U.S., why would you come here? Um, I never knew why they came there. Uh, but that was, that was how much of a context I had for moving abroad is all but impossible, which is weird because if you grow up most places in the world, the idea that you can move to another country is a very casual thing. Yeah, it may take a bit of money, but you can almost always do it. But as an American, the idea sometimes is, and excuse the pun, absolutely foreign to you. So while I always loved the idea of travel and seeing the world, it was not part of my childhood to envision myself actually going out and living in different places. So that didn't happen until I was older. And now I went to university in a different state. I traveled and worked around the United States quite extensively. And of course, as I started to get older, the idea that I could live abroad started to dawn on me. When my wife and I first uh, got together in 2001, married in 2003, uh, we always kicked around the idea of potentially moving abroad. And very early on, when we had been married for just three years, uh, House Hunters in International came out, which I, even though the show is very contrived and, and just kind of an awful view of the world in many ways, it does provide a lot of view of different countries. One of the reasons I like it is because they take 
quality cameras and quality cinematographers, uh, probably junior ones, but you know, people who are trained and know what they're doing. And they go around the world and show different countries and towns and places that you don't see in travel logs, right? They'll, they'll show like a small beach town that someone might consider moving to, but may not vacation on. And so their view of the world is a little bit different, even though it's contrived a bit to make it look good for television, it still broadens your horizon. So I credit them with a little bit of helping to push the idea that you could simply move to other countries and that there was a lot of other countries you might want to consider moving to. Very early on in their run, of course, all these episodes are gone now. I have no idea how you would ever see one, but one of their earliest episodes uh, was on Nicaragua, and I've long thought it must be San Juan del Sur, but my quick research tells me it probably was Managua, but they showed some living in Nicaragua that when my wife and I watched it, we were totally like, this is not how we pictured Nicaragua at all. I never thought of Nicaragua in this way, and it put Nicaragua very solidly onto our radar in our consciousness, even though we weren't thinking of moving abroad at that time, and you know, I was starting a business, we were newly married, we didn't have kids yet, and we were just, you know, interested in the world, and it really piqued our interest, and we both remember very acutely having seen this episode and the whole idea that they showed of the, the I remember very clearly, right, like modern apartment living that seemed very appealing to us, low cost of living, of course, that's always appealing uh, to anyone but the richest, um, billionaires, uh, access to the ocean, great weather, seemed like such a nice place. And the lifestyle that they showed on the show, which of course, again, contrived, right, but looked so interesting, this whole outdoor family gathering, people eating, friends coming over to hang out. It was just a whole world we had never pictured existing so close and affordably next door. And so it really just kind of seeped into our mindset from that age. And of course we watched that and we watched Rick Steve's Best of Europe and, and you know, very involved in travel stuff over the years. Now we were very poor when we were first together. So the amount of travel we did was pretty limited. We did some Canadian travel. We did travel around the United States. My job took me continuously on the road, which made other travel difficult, but it did allow me to see just tons of the US. I've worked in like half the states. That's probably not quite true, but it's a lot. Like I, and and uh, her family, we were from uh, upstate New York. Her family moved to Houston, Texas. And so we would constantly drive across the country. I've done the full drive from New York to Texas and back round trip more than 40 times. I know every path, every road, every stop, everything the whole way uh, in, in many different directions. I've driven from New York to Florida multiple times. I've crisscrossed every place. I can go on nearly any back road that really connects different areas to each other. And I probably have seen it before. I used to drive so much. I used to commute between Washington, D.C. and upstate New York because I didn't want to live in the city, but I needed to work on Farragut Square for a while. And so I would do that. Like, so I really, really put in travel time, but it was mostly domestic or just slightly a field in those early years. But by 2007, we were in a position where I had an office in Europe and we were able to go spend a little bit of time, just very, very tiny, uh, took a trip over to the UK and worked in England and Belfast, met with my teams, worked out of the office, got to spend, you know, it was really good travel for us because it allowed us to, to breach a, we were already very interested in moving abroad, right? We had the, by this point, uh, we are, uh, at least a year past having learned about Nicaragua years into talking about, you know, we could potentially someday move abroad. Where might we want to go? That trip gave us a lot of opportunity to learn about how to travel internationally, what it's like going to Europe, taking really long flights, how to deal with completely new countries that we knew nothing about, uh, internal flights, and it just gave us a lot of confidence that we'd be able to travel internationally into Europe and do a lot more. Two years later, I came back to Europe on my own because we had just had a baby girl and uh, I had an event that had been scheduled for 10 years. Uh, so I came in 2009 uh, to Germany, went to the Netherlands. Um, and and spent a couple weeks there on my own, did a whole bunch of solo travel in continental Europe, which was another step of really gaining a lot of travel experience and confidence because I was completely alone. I didn't do a lot of planning like we had with uh, previous trips. It was very much just seat in my pants, showing up in the Netherlands, needing to get to Germany and figuring it out as I went, which drove my wife crazy, but was absolutely perfect for me. It was a very fun, relaxed trip. I got to spend a lot of time uh, trying to speak German, eating German food, walking absolutely everywhere. I like took like one taxi the whole time I was there, uh, working out the trains on my own in Europe, doing everything in cash, multiple countries and multiple types of cash, working with ATMs, uh, dealing with hotels in foreign languages. And that was our first time of either of us being in a place that didn't speak English. That was a completely new experience for me, right? England, Ireland, Canada, United States, every place I'd ever been 
was in English. So this was this was a big step for us. And it went amazingly well. I had such a good time. My wife was very sad she couldn't go. And she was going to go, but at the last second she decided that our baby was still too young and she didn't feel confident traveling with her. So it gave me a chance to do solo travel, which ended up being a wonderful experience. I really missed my family, but I did have some really cool adventures. And sometime I'll make a video about that trip because uh, it's been now uh, quite a long time and it was absolutely fantastic. It was It was such a good trip. That gave us a lot of confidence. So I came back and pretty soon after that trip, maybe about a year, my job uh, told us that they had they'd had some financial troubles and they were going to lay someone off. And uh, a bunch of my team got together, a bunch of the seniors, because we knew a junior was going to be laid off, not one of us. And uh, the seniors got together and went to management and said, we were all going to take time without pay in order to save an unknown person's job. But we, we knew who it would be a pool of. And because uh, everyone was good, there wasn't like a bad person to eliminate that was like, ah, that person hasn't been pulling their weight. And it's, it's, it's a good opportunity to cut them. It was these, this is a great team. We all like working together. We don't want to see anyone lose their jobs. So we're going to just evenly take a cut across the board um, in, in return for time off because they were going to get rid of someone. It wasn't like we had to take a pay cut, but we had to take, we had to get less pay, but do less work. So we worked that out with management and I, because I was the most senior, I was able to work out a deal where I took the, the pay cut immediately, but didn't take the time for the pay cut for quite some time. So in 2011, um, we had a period of time where I was not getting paid uh, for my turn in the cycle. And of course, my job was, fan you know, they were ecstatic that we were willing to do this. They didn't want to cut people either. And they did recover and everybody went back to full salary after a period of time. So it all worked out pretty well. It was the right decision for sure. And for us as a family, it was absolutely perfect. During this time, I should mention, we had originally lived in New York. We moved to Texas during this window. Not that it's super relevant, but that kind of gives a framing. So we were living in Texas when this happened. So we took the pay cut. We tightened our belts and spent a year living very frugally because we had taken a very large pay cut uh, during that year. But that meant that we were spending more time at home, more time cooking for ourselves. And we really dug into Rick Steve's The Best of Europe because we had decided, and this is why I, I spoke to uh, my management and said, you know, what we want to do is we want to go to Europe and put in a bunch of time in one big block. I have this event coming up with two weddings in New York. It frames a, a two month period that we could be in Europe and I, and I have to be in New York for these weddings. So it would be a perfect time for us to be in Europe in between. They were like, absolutely, that works fine. Um, so we worked out this amazing deal. So I had all of 2011. Also in early 2011, we had our second baby. Uh, so we couldn't go anywhere during 2011, which was very important for us that the time where I was getting without pay was also when there was no way we could travel. So it was a huge opportunity because I never took vacations. Uh, the, the 2009 trip, I had scheduled many years, four years in advance with, with work. That was my only like real vacation other than our honeymoon since we had been together, right? So, so there was a huge amount of time. At this point, I'm up to 10 years with only that honeymoon and, um, uh, and that one trip to Germany that, was, that I wasn't working during the time. Uh, when I went to England and Northern Ireland, I was working during that time. Uh, and, and when we went to Canada on other trips, we were always working or it was like weekend trips. We'd do, you know, take like a three-day, four-day weekend, but we never took time off. I always worked. And so uh, we really didn't want our first time that we were taking months of vacation to be a staycation and give up our one chance to travel. And that's really why we traveled as little as we did. I was always working at the office. I was on call 24-7, 365. Uh, with my job on Wall Street, and I had my own company that was very demanding. And so between things, it was always taking just huge amounts of my time. So travel was very difficult. And so 2011, we sat down and, and really spent our free time tightening our belts and watching PBS. And so we watched every single episode of Rick Steve's The Best of Europe many times. We got travel books and poured over maps and worked out different routes and just planned and planned and planned and planned, which is not something I would normally do for travel, but we had no other option. It was the only way we could spend, uh, maximize our, our potential trip because we needed to make this trip count. So in 2012, our goal that we spent all of 2011, like literally the basically the entire year, we spent just planning this amazing trip where we were going to take our two young children backpack around Europe and go to all of the, the really must-see locations that we felt, what if this was our only European trip? We hope that wasn't the case. We knew that Europe was on our radar. We kind of like to move there someday. I had from time to time looked at uh, European jobs. It's, it's been in the works. It's been stuff we'd played with. We knew that I had offices. Sometimes I got offers to switch over, but often with a pay cut. So sometimes we would get an offer. Sometimes it would fall through. We almost had moved to Belfast many years before. Uh, so we knew that this was a potential. So we uh, we wanted to make sure that in case we didn't have an opportunity 
to ever go again that we went and saw the absolute must-see places on each of our lists. So each of us made a can't miss it list. And then we also made a list of the places that we felt most likely represented places we might want to try living uh, in the near future, that we wanted to go scout out locations so that we could make educated decisions about the future. And so we made a list of those, and then we played with how we could best put all that together into a single trip, how we could do it in a single big loop, uh, because we wanted to cover a lot of ground. There was so much of Europe we didn't know uh, reasonably that we needed to see just outrageously large amounts of it all in one go. So this was this was a huge planning project. So 2011 to us was the travel planning year. In our minds, we were already in Europe at that point. We were so completely focused on getting on that plane and heading out that that was 2011 was almost more of a living abroad year than any other time in our lives. And we never left Texas. Uh, so it was very, very odd for us. But then in 2012, uh, we took our kids. Our eldest was three. Our youngest was barely one. And we started by flying off to, uh, first we went to New York. I went to my cousin's wedding. And then we went off to uh, to England, went to Nottingham. And I did have a little bit of work to do for other things. So I was hosting uh, and helping host uh, different uh, technology forum events while I was over there. It was I'm very well known in those circles. And so it was an opportunity that because I was in Europe, I went from country to country, meeting and greeting and, and helping host technical events in those countries while I was there. Uh, so we started by going and, and hosting an event in Nottingham, spent some time in Nottingham, uh, and then headed off and did this huge loop of Europe going through uh, France and Belgium, Germany, uh, the Alsace in France, Western Switzerland, Eastern Switzerland, Munich and, and Bavaria, uh, over to um, Austria, down to Italy, Northern Italy. We didn't go down to like Rome or anything like that. Did Tuscany and uh, Milan, um, kind of hopped over France again, got into Barcelona, did Catalonia, then down to Madrid in Spain, over to Lisbon in Portugal, back to England and back home all over the course of two months. Uh, and then uh, went, uh, I went to my other cousin's wedding, also in New York in the same place as the first one or nearly the same place, uh, and then returned to Texas. So it's a huge amount of time that we spent planning for. And then it's a huge amount of time that we spent in Europe, uh, during 2011 and 2012. And when we got back, um, I went to my, my job and I'm like, we're going to give you another year, but next year we need a commitment that my job is going to be based out of Europe. I'm going to keep doing the same job. We have offices there. I'll work it out. Like we'll, we'll come up with something, but I'm going to be based out of Europe, not out of the United States. And at the time they thought that was going to work when, when the year came around and I said, okay, it's time. And they said, no, management's not going to let you do it. I said, okay, well, you know what that means. And I moved on. Um, so we had hoped on our plan was that 2012 was a scouting and 2013 was the move. But 2013, it didn't end up working out that way. I did not find a job in Europe. I got a really amazing job uh, on Hedge Fund Row in Connecticut. So we ended up moving back to a house that we still owned in New York uh, and lived there. So, so at this point, um, basically by 2011, we were in nonstop motion. And looking back, we didn't know it at the time, but it was our plan. And essentially, it was happening. So 2007 and 2009 were like scouting trips, building up our confidence and saying, yes, this is something we want to do. Uh, 2011 was planning. 2012 was actually going for a long period of time, really building up a, we can go to places we don't speak the language. We can take young kids. We can go from country to country. We can hop around. We can live out of suitcases. We can, we can really do this. Like we've got the skills to be able to do this. We made a podcast called Kidding Around Europe, which is still available. If you go to Apple Music, Amazon, anything like that, Spotify, and look for Kidding Around Europe. Uh, we didn't document the entire trip, but we did document quite a bit of it, uh, roughly at the time, like a year later, uh, which I, I think it's a pretty good podcast, especially for the era. So if you want to check that out. That'd be really cool. I appreciate people listening to that. Uh, that's my wife and I doing it. Maybe someday I'll get her to finish it up and try to remember what the trip was like and get those the last bits of the trip into uh, the podcast because I think there's some really interesting stuff uh, that we haven't hit yet. And, uh, uh, and then immediately in 2012, we started making the plans to move in 2013. 2013, we didn't make it to Europe, but we did make it from Texas back to New York and Connecticut. We had never gotten rid of our house in New York, not because we didn't want to. Ended up living in our own house where my youngest, where my eldest was born, which was really interesting that they got to go back and live in a house that we had owned for a, a really long time, um, but that they didn't remember. And uh, and then we just gave it one year. I had taken a job in Europe in 2014. Uh, my job in the U.S. Um, uh, threatened us with lawsuits if we tried to move to Europe and take uh, a job. 
there. It ended up stalling things, but we ended up on full pay and able to stay home for six months. So while it was a huge delay in our plans, you can see how in our minds we're still in motion, right? We had committed to going to Europe. We'd given it a year. They didn't move us to Europe. They didn't move us to Europe. We got a job in Europe. Then they ended up fighting on that. So we were waiting to see if we were able to get that job in Europe. Went through the end of 2014, but I got to stay home with the kids. So we're in New York. We're still planning on Europe. We're still doing research. In our minds, we're just making it happen. It was just taking a little bit of time. So we got stalled during those years, but we were always in motion of moving abroad. Uh, and then by early 2015, eventually I was able to secure a nonprofit job in Madrid, uh, which kind of forced the hand of the company that had tried to sue us to stop uh, moving abroad, uh, to taking another job, and uh, they decided to settle with us. So by uh, 2015, at the beginning of the year, we were in a position where we were able to head off and make our move to Spain. At that point, we were moving. We gave up our houses and, and didn't keep anything and just, we were gone, right? Um, that was that was us making the decision that we were just cutting ties and going. And so that was a really dramatic moment for us. Everything before that was planning and, and hoping and scouting and yeah, lots of time backpacking, but completely different. Going in uh, uh, 2015 was we had nowhere to come back to. We had, uh, we did still own properties, but they were all like friends were living in them or whatever. Like we didn't have a place to come back. We couldn't store our stuff in our houses. My father, um, I think it was at this point, I think it was during this time when I was stuck at home and couldn't go anywhere. Uh, and maybe I have these dates wrong. My father will correct me, but uh, is about when he built a storage unit in the barn. So I grew up on a farm in Western New York uh, and and we have a barn there. Uh, so my father took one of the stalls because it used to have horses, but it was long since had had horses and he built a really large probably like 12 or 15 by 15 uh storage unit with raised floor very well sealed multiple shelving spots ways to hoist things and we were able to take everything that we wanted to keep even some of the big furniture items because we had collected furniture over the years we had owned multiple houses so it had uh, accumulated and we moved all of that into uh the into that storage unit so we didn't have to have this giving everything up and we also didn't have to keep paying for uh, for storage, which would have been financially very difficult. So that that was a big savings for us, a really big deal, and allowed us to have this uh, storage unit that we could come back to, change out our clothes, get winter clothes. When we're visiting, we could go get stuff. The kids put their toys into storage. Um, and it's very sad for us because our kids still have many of the things from 2015 in storage today, and we're still working on figuring some of that out. A lot of it was nostalgic, not stuff that they actually want to see day to day, but loads of stuffed animals, their, their childhood toys, a lot of their memories are locked away and they haven't seen them in many years. So we're we're hoping now that we have a permanent home that that's something we'll be able to address in the coming future. And there are very specific things we're waiting on that could make that happen uh, sooner than later. So that's, uh, that's a big aspect of our lives as well. So that storage unit really gave us flexibility to give everything else up and uh, and off to Spain we went. And it was the most amazing experience. So we lived in Spain and then we started hopping because we weren't going for permanent residency anywhere, but we were fully living in the places we wanted. We were renting long-term houses, but with, with uh, uh, furniture. We were um, you know, setting up in a village. We weren't going for big cities. We weren't doing touristy stuff. We were setting up and working. I was writing books, working, running my company, actually working from the places that we want. So I was a full digital nomad uh, without a home base in the U.S. And uh, from Spain, we moved on to Panama. Uh, from Panama, we moved on to Nicaragua. That's when we discovered lit life here and fell in love with the region and really decided that this was uh, a place that we really liked, but we didn't make the permanent decision at that time. That was going to be quite a while um, until... Uh, we were really sure because we had so much of the world we wanted to see, so many places that we thought were such good candidates that we had to check them out or places we just really wanted to uh, discover for a while that we weren't ready to completely settle down. From there, we ended up moving back to Europe and spending a bunch of years moving through Romania, Italy, Greece, Ukraine, and ended up stuck in the United States during COVID. But just before COVID, I was back in Nicaragua after having spent a bit of time with my friend Alan, who was for a couple of years looking at where he wanted to move him because I had been living all over the place. Uh, he came to me and was like, you know, I'm looking for a place on the beach. I want a place I can retire someday, but I want to start getting involved with the place now. Where would you recommend it? We spent years looking to, into a lot of options for him, including Ecuador, which was really good at the time, Mexico, and just a bunch of places, Panama, 
Costa Rica and Nicaragua bubbled up to the top time and time again as the right place that would make sense for him with the cost of living, lifestyle, safety, all those concerns just kept coming back to Nicaragua. So after doing a lot of research, both uh, me doing research for him and him doing his own finally decided that Nicaragua was the place. And for about a year, he kept being like, when are we going down? When am I going to get to see this in person? And for years, um, my company had been working in Nicaragua. So we've been involved ever since I lived here. So we have a lot of history, even though I wasn't living here, been involved in Nicaragua all that time consistently. And so finally, in late 2019, we were able to come down and spend a little bit of time. And he just fell in love with the country as he had expected to. It was exactly what he was anticipating, which is a perfect uh, example of if you do enough research, there's a good chance you're not going to be too surprised when you get on the ground. There were certainly things that caught him by surprise, but they weren't showstoppers. They were just, ah, oh, this wasn't what I was expecting. There's a whole bunch of new country. You have no way to really, I say this a lot, breathe the air and know what it like feels like right so that was kind of shocking but the you know the cost of living the safety everything was as he expected and he are, he had really gotten to know the maps knew the layout of the places so he was really prepared uh and so it ended up just perfect for him being back at that time i spent a bit of time uh, in san juan del sur went back up to granada where i'd lived previously and spent some time and when i came, when i got back home i talked to my wife dominica and i said you know of all the places we've been and, uh, you know, just what makes sense for us, I really feel like Nicaragua is the right place to make our home base. And then we can still explore the world. We can still travel. We can still do all kinds of things. But I think instead of, you know, coming back and forth and going through the U.S., especially when we don't have a house there and we don't have, uh, you know, we have to deal with a storage unit and all this stuff, I think having Nicaragua be our home, making that our, our real residence and spending our time there. And then when we want to travel, travel from Nicaragua, makes a lot of sense. It's the right cost. It's safe. It's We love the country. We had such a good experience there. Uh, but And then she was hesitant because of our experience in Granada. It's just we, way too touristy and warm because there's not as much air there uh, as in Leon. Not enough air flow. Like the city just kind of holds on to the heat a little bit more, even though it's not technically as hot. And it took a few weeks of discussing it. And then the family kind of came together and said, yeah, yeah, Nicaragua makes sense. And if you watch my vlog going back to early 2000, we're already talking about, yeah, we're, we're in the process of moving to Nicaragua. I talked to some friends from around that time and we were like, yeah, we're, we have this plan to go back to Nicaragua. I was just there, just did some planning and then COVID hit and we got stuck for a little while, but we still moved down during COVID. Uh, and it's been this permanent, amazing move since then. And this is, it, we've exactly played out, right? We, we have not had the chance to travel as much as we had hoped, but that's okay because our home base now is in Nicaragua. So we're, we're happy when we're not traveling and when we are, right? And, and we're closer to a lot of things that we want to go to. When we want to go to Europe, it's a little bit more complicated from here, but not bad. When we want to go to South America or other parts of Central America or Mexico, it's just as easy or easier from here than it was from the United States. And our everyday is living in a place that we love and getting the, the expat experience that we love um, and, and being lower cost and just giving us uh, more bang for our buck and, and a, a lifestyle that makes us really happy. And so when we're home, and in fact, many times we're like, I don't know how much I feel like traveling just because it's kind of like every day is still like traveling. We've only been expats here specifically for so long and we still are exploring the country, exploring the region, um, getting to know, you know, deeper and deeper life here. And because of that, that kind of gives us that feeling of being uh, out and exploring and still on an adventure. And it's different because, you know, we've gotten to know town. We've got lots of friends here and we've become integrated into society to some degree. And, uh, you know, we're, we're very entrenched, but we're still relatively new. There's still just new experiences that, that come along. And when you move to a new place, you, you're going to have that for quite, quite some time in most cases, even if you move to someplace relatively familiar and it just, it takes time to really become, uh, uh, you know, really, really, close to being native. You'll never be native, right? That will never happen. But it takes a lifetime to really move in that direction. And, uh, you know, I think some people think that you, you're never going to be, get close to it at all. And often enclave living will we'll keep that from happening. Uh, but if you uh, move to a country and really try to integrate. Generally, it does take most of a lifetime. It's really hard to take your original context and shift it to a new place. That's a hard thing to do. Uh, and so because of that, if, if the thing that you love is traveling, being an expat, even in one place and not moving around very much, often maintains a certain feels like traveling vibe, especially if it's, if it's a new language as well, uh, for 
for a very long time. And of course, we're, we've done some traveling from here. Uh, my wife spent some time in Southeast Asia. I spent some time in South America. Uh, we've been to around Central America. We've been to Costa Rica. Uh, and, uh, and we're planning on doing a lot more soon. And, and we're trying to work in that direction. Right now, we're still paused on a lot of things, waiting for our formal residency to come through, because there's just a lot of paperwork and stuff we have to do with that. But so we've now been on the move for roughly 10 years that we officially left our home country and have been expats uh, finding our way in the world. But really, we kind of see the adventure as having started um, most accurately in 2011, even though we were still in the United States, that year of just nonstop planning for movement, we were fully into expat mode and, and making it happen. And, and everything since then has been the process of actually creating the expat lifestyle that uh, that we now have that we want um and it's been it's been a fantastic journey um so i i just wanted to be able to share that with you guys because someone had asked about it and i realized that a lot of people don't know like how we became expats why we became expats and and really it's just always been a sense of adventure we've always wanted to go out i can hear the rain coming i'm about to be and that just hit all of a sudden we're gonna move under the shelter it's been no more than 20 seconds since i was recording and i just stepped under the roof so that I don't get all wet. That was a lot of rain really fast. This season, we tend to get the rain from uh, the west, and so we actually hear it hit the neighbor's house just before we get wet, because uh, it, it's not very windy. And so I hear this heavy rain, like, whoa, and run under, so uh, it's already all wet. Like, that's crazy. This is why we get the flash floods in the city. Anyway, uh, you know, I really wanted to share kind of our adventure and, and what drove us. And, and we really just have this sense of adventure. We want to raise our kids with a global context. We don't want them to be tied to a single country, a single culture. Um, and, and we don't want, right? We want our lives to be a constant fun adventure of exploring. We want life to be safe. We want it to be affordable. We want to be able to do things that we want to do as a family. And um, we, we love traveling. We love living abroad. And so it's hard to put your finger on exactly what it is that makes us the people who get out and, and live on the road and, and don't have that traditional uh, uh, stationary uh, lifestyle. But it's just who we've always been. Um, and, and before we moved abroad, that's who we were in the United States, just constantly moving, always going new places. And, uh, now that we're out in the world, we just, we, we love being able to explore other places. And, and that exploration has led us to Nicaragua as a home base. So we kind of have these two aspects to our expat existence. One is that we wanted a home base that we really felt at home in, that a place that really just resonated with us. And Nicaragua has been that for us. Um, and I always say like, that might be true for you, but the thing that is almost certainly guaranteed for you is that you need to get out there and find the place that resonates with you. May not be the same place as me, may not be the same place as people I know, but some place is going to make you excited to live there. Some place is going to be your happy. And, and I recommend that people go out there and find that. And for us, that's been Nicaragua. It's just been such a good experience. And, uh, but we still love being travelers. We love exploring the world and, and seeing the world. And, uh, Nicaragua has made that more possible for us and uh, we're going to be uh, bringing you more from around the world very soon as as travel becomes easier for us uh, and our paperwork gets done so thank you for joining me on this little kind of uh, personal excursion down my my personal history and and give you a little bit of context of who we are as as travelers and and uh, expats and and as a family so Thanks for joining me. If you'd like to support the channel, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller, as always. And uh, like, subscribe, do all those things. And uh, I will see all of you tomorrow. And we'll pop up some videos on the screen. Just click on one of those or scroll down. Click on something that YouTube recommends. It tells the algorithm a lot uh, to recommend this show in the future.